right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to my talk from Cloud Native to Cloud Native. My name is Max Körbecher, and I'm co founder of a company called Liquid Reply. We're based in Germany and actually help our customers to implement Kubernetes platforms actually everywhere. So we have edge use cases running in distributed environments, going all the way up to cloud providers and even scale them throughout the globe, so running on multiple continents and multiple different regions and so on. So in my daily work, I most of the time are more yeah, giving some consultancy and advisory and try to answer questions from the customer. What is the right way to do my Kubernetes? How I need to configure it correctly? How I bring my teams to Kubernetes? And how I make them actually use um, of it and so on. And I need to give you a little warning for today because it's like not like there's one technical problem and there's a technical solution for it or we're talking about processes. But we are speaking about something which is some way meta. It's in, in between. Um, there are some technical components. There are some kind of processes. But there's a lot of, yeah, this, this thing which in a company glues the team together which is the reason why, for example, um, one team is successful with migrating to a cloud and getting cloud native, and while another team is maybe not that successful. And this is something which we try to find out today, and where I will give you our perspective of multiple projects with multiple customers, and what we have recently seen in it, and what is our observations on it. And we will also find out what you can do to actually maybe not stuck somewhere, but can move forward get some light speed into it, and even being successful. So the thing is, nowadays, it's super easy to go to a cloud. You just need a credit card. Doesn't matter if you're an enterprise, a small company, a person, a startup. The entry boundary is very low. And it is also fairly easy to use. You can just click your things somehow together. Or if you get more techy, you can build your pipelines. You can use some declarative formats, infrastructure as a code, and so on and so forth. But it's very much about you to understand or to yeah, decide if this is more like a one-way flight ticket through the clouds, and then you somewhere will get stuck, maybe. Or if this is the beginning of a cloud-native journey, something which lasts long, where you have a long time business visit, which will be the foundation of a lot of your services and implementations for the future. So I give you a short time to read this beautiful Dilbert, and then we will proceed on why is this on, is so true. So the point is, this is something which I have at least once in a month as a discussion with a customer. It's like, I have this and that problem. I need to solve that and that. Can we not just containerize it and bring it to Kubernetes and the world is beautiful? Well, as someone who is consultant for Kubernetes, I would love always to say yes and let's start a project and we will help you. But the truth is it's not always that easy because the technology can solve just one half of the story, sometimes even just one third of the story. But there's way more around which you need to be aware of before you can do anything with a cloud native and before you can become cloud native. So we always see there some kind of pyramid. And the foundation for this pyramid is actually the way of thinking, your methodology. Maybe some engineers between you will say like, hey, but what is with the infrastructure? And we come to that later. But the foundation for a cloud native transformation, for a cloud native journey, doesn't lie in the first step in the technology itself. It is all about how you are thinking about it and what do you want to achieve with it and how much you are interested in it. Because the cloud native space is moving so fast, if you're not interested in it, what you will learn today is outdated tomorrow. And this is something where you need to stay with your mind and be ready to, to keep along with. And then another part is the internal developer platform. This is what we often put together. It's most of the time based on Kubernetes. It allows us a lot of automation but it is more about the extensions which are implemented around, which helps the development team from the pure software development perspective to speed up, ensure the integrity of the system, ensure the security that everything is fine, 
all the way into the production. And then we have something where I always have a little bit of difficulties to name it. On the one hand side, it's the business requirements. And on the other hand side, it's the application development. Not every business requirement is a reason for developing a software which is cloud native. And sometimes it would be even more expensive to go this way. But it's often a good option. And you should be aware of evaluate it and take a look for some points where you say, like, well, maybe we can support here with a business with building something based on microservices, which is fast, which can be stateless, and so on and so forth. And last, we have the infrastructure. And the infrastructure is very interesting because from a customer perspective, the pyramid looks like this. The infrastructure is a big enemy in the end. It's something where all the complexity lays and all the costs are somehow hidden and it's maybe scales up and down and do weird things and then you have hundreds of regions and hundreds of services and so on and so forth. But that's not the biggest problem. Nowadays, you can define and describe everything human readable and you can automate everything of it. Yes, you need to learn about it, but well, we also learned how to walk, we learned how to speak, we learned how to cook. So as an engineer, as a technician, you for sure are very fast able to catch up what's going on in a cloud provider and what you're able to do with it. Our perspective of the story consulting major enterprises is it's all about the mindset. It's all about how the teams and the people think about to implement cloud native and how really to yeah, succeed in their journey. If you're not interested in modernize your application, maybe rebuild it from scratch into smaller chunks, um, then you will not also go the way to do something cloud native because you miss already one of the foundation. And the other thing is cloud native also doesn't mean that you need to go to the clouds. You can use cloud native principles wherever you are. As said, we build micro clouds on the edge. <coughs> they are totally disconnected from any kind of internet. Or we scale it full up. But the principles behind it are still the same counting for everything on the cloud native environment. So this is a very common picture if you search for like, what is actually cloud native? And you will find this and that and yada, yada, yada. The thing is, this is all unimportant because it does not matter so much what is written on the left side or on the right side, because depending on where you are in your integration and your step of engineering, it can be true also for the other side. But very important is here the mindset again. And you will hear this word a lot today, but it's one of the key factors when we are talking about our uh, cloud native transformation and when we're talking about getting teams into a position where they are able to build platforms which are ready for the future, which can adopt with continuously updates and changes and replacing integrations. So let's talk about a few observations, something where some of you maybe will find yourself, where some of you will say, well, this is an obvious one. And some of you will maybe say like, well, we already passed this by, but this is exactly the story which I had. The first thing is, and we're still discussing it, which is quite confusing after many years, that companies think Kubernetes is just another hypervisor. So like VMware comparable, or SX, vSphere, this stuff. But this is absolutely not true. Kubernetes is a platform. It is something which helps to build your own platform. Or if you want to add one other platform, you can say it's a platform to build cross-platform platforms. What it means like you can build with one solution something which runs the same way on your uh, virtualized infrastructure, on your bare metal, and in the cloud provider, giving your developers, in the end, the same experience. And Kubernetes is a system to manage. It helps you to manage your workload. It helps you to manage your resource and extensions of the resources which you can use. It's enriched enrich this actually, and it runs your application. But do not misunderstand running here as like a hypervisor again. Running just means it takes care about all the complexity around, about security, about networking, about authorization, 
all those heavy liftings where you normally have already a year-long project for it if you want to set it up in a classical infrastructure. And what we also see, Kubernetes is often treated as a one-time implementation. And this is no joke. We have seriously some customers where we've re-implemented same kind of platform in different shapes on different cloud providers. But where you really should take a look on it and where you should think about it, if you build a Kubernetes platform, then you need a continuous available team for it, a product team, someone who is listening to their end users, development teams, someone who is listening to what is needed in the future, and also who is part of the community. Because the cloud native community around Kubernetes and all the other tools you're using is moving so fast that you need someone, a whole team for it, to keep track of it. On the other hand side, if you do it well, you don't need much more than that for operate your infrastructure. If you're doing it good, you get also a lot of benefits out of it, even so the workload in the beginning looks tremendous. And what absolutely doesn't work is if, like myself in the past, I was an enterprise architect, and I draw beautiful blueprints and run to the teams and like, look, this is the, the solution for everything. And blueprint, you know, it's like a recipe, you follow it. But it's not a guarantee that the food in the end is good or tasty or that you like it. Because what is often not written in some kind of blueprint is your, how you spice it up, the salt and pepper you need, which you need to add. Or maybe the chili, if you like. And the same is with blueprint. It's not a solution and it will not help necessarily your teams to succeed when you move to a cloud. And especially not when you want to get cloud native. So your platform team, which builds a platform, also needs to be trained, be good in communication, and help others, like an internal consultancy, to understand how this platform works. And I know that a few people here from companies we worked with, and they tell me all the time the same story. I'm, my workload is so much, not because I have to implement something, but because I have to consult the, the people to adopt my platform. But that's a very important point. And then finally, one of the biggest things, the most applications which we are seeing, they're absolutely not made for being microservice oriented and most of the time also not optimized for running on Kubernetes. When you take a look on the cloud native survey, it's quite interesting because, for example, in Europe, it says like something between 70 and 80 percent of the companies and major enterprises using containers and Kubernetes. But the other way around, when you take a look on the cloud native developer report, there's only 27 of the people who answered uh, telling that they use actually Kubernetes in their everyday life. And there is a very big gap in between. For sure, you want to help on the one side that no one needs to understand the full ecosystem of Kubernetes and not needs to understand the 500, 600, I don't know how many open source projects out there. That's not your target. But you need to understand the foundation of Kubernetes to actually build software to run on Kubernetes. And we will come to this in a while. So how we can stay on the cloud native side? If we do cloud journey, if we migrate, and if we want to change our mindset. Well, the first big thing is you need to be more like a surgeon. When you do a cloud native transformation, this is not about coming with a very big hammer, just slash the wall out and move everyone into the fresh air and start somewhere. This will often not help because it's overwhelming. It can lead to frustration. It's like you come to a new country and you do not speak the language, you do not understand the people, you, you have absolutely nothing where you can rely on. And then someone says like, well, now let's build a successful business here within the next three months. And I would like that it's adopted by millions of users till the end of the year. For sure, when you work hard, you have a chance to succeed. But it's a human nature on this point to say like, well, that's a little bit too much for me at this point. And this will not help you. So you need to be very precise. You need to find the people in your corporate who are already interested, who have this drive, this motivation, this interest, 
It's maybe the young guys and girls which are here today, which are convincing their bosses, their leaders to say like, I need to go to this conference, I need to understand what they are doing, I need to talk with the people. And these are the people you need to find within your companies, bring them together and give them a new playground. And yes, it's really a playground. There should be no rules. They should have whatever they need, whatever makes them fun to develop their skill set and the capability to build a platform, to build a platform for your companies and to build a foundation where you can get truly cloud native. So start by zero is a very important factor. And I know companies do not like to hear it, but the truth is if you're an expert in chemistry, the chance that you will be a digital expert in chemistry is quite unrealistic because this is not your expertise. Your expertise is somewhere else. It works in the past, it will work in the future. What you can do with digital services is to enrich your capabilities. You can make your product better, faster, more transparent, but it's not 100% cloud native. And that's why it also sometimes doesn't make sense to compare a major engineering company with something like a Netflix or a Spotify because they have a totally different past. The one is cloud born, they started with, dig with digital services, they know all the pain, and I mean, meanwhile those companies are very old, they are not startups anymore. And you have exactly the, the same experience, but with your domain, with your, with your specific knowledge. So to make the step from the one side to the other side, you need to first, I don't want to say get rid of, but at least try to ignore your past and get this playground where you can do whatever you want to do. And I before had here even a line in it saying like, well, ideally you get rid of your CXO, whoever is taking care about this department, who's taking care about your money, who's taking care about some guidance and rules and whatsoever so that you have really something where you can build from scratch and there's no one annoying you, no one telling you, oh, this doesn't work in our industry or this doesn't make sense for our industry. Because this way of thinking is not the way how it helps you to build a cloud native environment. So again, the mindset makes a difference. Strategic wise, customers also often choose cloud provider by money. And from an economical perspective, I can fully understand. If I can save 30 million on the one to comparable to the other one where I'm currently running, it's maybe very attractive. But often it doesn't make sense, for example, to migrate from the one cloud provider to the other cloud provider. For which reason? You want to save 30 million euro, but you need five years to migrate all of your workload which you have before built up already. You need to retrain all your employees who know the one cloud provider to use the other cloud provider. And even you, if you don't do this whole long story and you will start by zero, you maybe should start by taking a look about the technical capabilities of the cloud provider first. Because there's nothing more frustrating and more slowing down the process to adopt this kind of technologies than when the technology doesn't work. Because you cannot change it. If you want to implement something and the cloud provider doesn't provide it to you, you have to wait. Or you have to wait uh, to build it by your own. And we see this quite often as one of the reasons like, okay, we are going there and there. It seems like it's a cheap but good resource for us. They can do on the paper what the all cloud, other cloud providers also can do. But then the project takes three months is longer and you need five more people and then come some deadlines and you want to go to the production, but the service is actually not available somewhere else. So when you do this, you should think from the beginning about what you will need technology-wise so that you will not get the pain in the end. And maybe, and I'm pretty sure in it, you will also lose absolutely no money. Even so, like another solution, maybe costs a little bit more. No panic, you don't need to read it. It's just for wrapping up for someone who wants to read the slides later. So when we're moving a little bit more to the perspective of developers, like the people who need to build something, what we experience is that quite often, suddenly nothing works. The CI CD fails, the Git repository is not available, 
we cannot push something, we cannot document something. And this is because resources are often saved on the development side. Nowadays, if something stops with this higher automation which we normally build, it means that we even cannot fix anymore anything in the cloud provider, for example, or in the platforms we build, build somewhere. So the infrastructure which we use for implementing is getting very, very critical, and it needs to be treated like this. It's the same like, I do not want to say your major application which brings you all the money, but it's very much comparable to it because if all the development tools fails, it's getting very difficult to fix something which is maybe running in production. Another thing, and I mentioned already earlier, we see projects are often time boxed, obviously. You get a team, 10 people, five months as you build the platform, goodbye. This is how most of the projects are working, and this is normally fine if you build something which afterwards is not going to be changed so much. But this doesn't work with your internal developer platforms, for example, based on open source or Kubernetes, because we have major releases every three months, and if you have just a default stack on Kubernetes running, you actually need to do every day, for example, an upgrade. Sure, you can bundle it and do it maybe once a week or every few weeks, but in the end, it's a few hundred updates you have to run. And this is just the maintenance side. You maybe have discovered this week a lot of new technologies, a lot of new projects, a lot of new products which you want to use, which you want to integrate. Who should do it if you just give your existing cluster to an operations team who is busy and most of the time do not have enough people um, to keep your cluster alive? And then you come like, look, here's a cool product. This will not work. Because internal developer platforms when they build right, are the foundation where all of your future projects are running on. And then this is something where you continuously have to work on, where you continuously have to adopt it, implement new features, extend it, and it's getting very critical for you. So you need to treat it like a lifelong living product. It's nothing which you just build and put into the corner and give it from time to time some water. It's not a a uh, cactus or something like that, which just, well, needs a little bit water and love from time to time. And last but not least, and again, please don't read all of these. It's just to show you that there's a lot of patterns, for example, in the cloud native environment. These patterns must be understood. And you need to train your developers, but you need to train also your platform engineering teams to know exactly when to use which pattern. And these patterns are often old but gold. I once got asked from, from an uh, engineer like, oh, you come with pattern, how old are you? You were enterprise architect in the past? And like, mm, yes, I, I was. But you know, it at least helps you to understand how the things should work. Because what we also see very often is that, for example, a config pattern is used as a database. Theoretically nice for development, maybe OK. But this is absolutely not the way to go if you would like to really use it, because what also happened, and you maybe know it, when you have implemented once something, it's very hard to get rid of after a while. It will stuck forever there. And we have seen there are a lot of dirty and shady things. Sidecar patterns, which communicate in the wrong directions. Daemon patterns for distributing an application for high availability. It shouldn't be there, not in this way. So to wrap it up from the development and product management perspective, if you focus so much on the IT, on your teams, on developing your products, projects, then you also need to give the right priority to the tools around it and to the education around it. It will not appear from nothing and it will not just come out of the air. It's just don't happen. But if the expectation is that it's somehow between a full week of deployments and fixing some stuff and maybe get an error done in the production st stage. To find then, for example, time like today on a KubeCon or this whole week on a KubeCon is not possible if you not actively push it, if you do not make the room available for your teams to take this time to understand and to learn. And obviously, we also need to talk about Kubernetes 
because that's why we at least partly here. And this is very basic, but it's so often done not right. Just get your security in the beginning of your projects already implemented. We just a few weeks ago finished a project where we had to re-implement all the security mechanisms, and it's a hell load of a work. And it's nearly impossible, because your output is like, well, if I activate now this, around 120 microservices are just going to die within one second. And it's such an amount of work to fix this, but if you have already the right processes around it for ARBAC and security um, and for network policies, in the beginning of your implementations, you will have in the long run never ever a problem because the people understand how it works. And the fun thing is that security with Kubernetes is super easy. It's not like in the past you need to start fiddling around, make some profiles and harden somewhere your server. For sure, a platform team needs to harden the server, but from a development perspective, you don't have to do this. And if you mess it up, then in the long run, you will get some pains with it before you go into production. This is what we often see. Development phase, all good. Testing phase, also everything fine, and then it hits production, nothing works. And not because it's production, but because suddenly you have security and network and role-based access control, which prevents that your services execute like you have done it before. <clears throat> and on the same layer is actually also the even more simpler things, like probes, startup probes, for example, or readiness checks, health checks. We see so many services, even from open source projects sometimes, which do not have any of these implemented. The fun thing is, if you have this implemented, it is the only thing which guarantees that Kubernetes will fight you so hard to shut down any kind of services. So it's super important if you want to build a software which is reliable and highly available. And in the past, we were also called uh, self-healing. But if you do not have it in place, Kubernetes will just raise the hand and say goodbye to your service. If you have it in place, Kubernetes is, will fight like a mother cat for their children uh, until everything is, is done and ready. And finally, we come to the master discipline. Multi-cluster, single cluster, one cluster for everything, one cluster per application. Actually, it does not matter so much which way you go. You should not choose one of the extreme, not one cluster for everything, but also not one cluster per application but everything in the middle is somewhere right. You can cluster your applications based on, for example, departments. Everything what does sales, everything what is for your production line, for example. Or for criticality. Maybe it's not the best thing to put everything what is highly critical on the same cluster, so this, maybe you should split. But for everything else, you can layer it a little bit up. And as long as you have a good automation in place, and you take care about that everything runs smoothly, the approach is absolutely unimportant. A good thumb rule for it is, the less scripts you have implemented in your CI CD pipelines, the better it is. Because every script is a single point of failure, every script is basically calling that you maybe do not handle any exceptions, and that your whole pipeline will break, and the state which you do not want to have stored somewhere, so less is sometimes way better. It must be easy to use, and you always should first take a look that you build something which is really useful, but which is not like having 500 features where you just use one out of it. Because sometimes those very complete platforms have 499 features which sometimes can cause issues for yourself, and you do not want to maintain something which no one uses, right? So the most important thing itself is just do not over-engineer. Don't do it. We have seen companies which built their whole own operators to do something while there was another operator available. If you're unhappy with one of these solutions, you can con go and contribute, for example. It is way more easier. And companies in this point are often a little bit yeah, worried about their intellectual property 
The thing is we do not build any business logic into the platforms. You do not sell any very specific knowledge of your industry to it, but you can solve the problem for yourself, for your other teams, and maybe even for companies which you are actually very close with. Companies which deliver parts to you, companies which deliver components to you, or where you deliver things to. So don't do it yourself. If you have problems with intellectual property, maybe sort it out how you as a company can also contribute to open source. So that makes it sometimes easier to fix problems and to get the things done and right for yourself. And to conclude, um, for the cloud native journey and where you're heading to, you do not need to reinvent the wheel. As you have seen today, there are around six, 7,000 people just here and around nine to 10,000 people online just interested in exactly the same things like you are interested. And they're running around so many experts in these fields which have solved already these problems. So why not to catch them up, discuss with them, bring your ideas to them. And maybe in a few weeks, in a few months, this feature will appear in one of the open source projects. Keep this thing simple. As I said, the over-engineering is sometimes killing projects from the inside because you increase the dependencies and nothing works anymore and everything's lost. You want to bring in new people, but they need months to get onboarded. They need months to understand what you have built. And then you hinder yourself to move forward. And obviously, design and build for change. You need to adopt changes within the environment. You need to be able to accept changes and to go with these changes. And you maybe sometimes even need to be able to handle that different platforms have different needs. But the good thing is it's not magic nowadays. And we see a lot of solutions which can help you to do it. So thank you very much. And if you have some time, come by into our booth and have a talk. We are happy to talk with you. <laughs>